Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. I'm honored to be here. My name is Tim Brzezinski. I'm a middle and high school math teacher here in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, I love to use EdTech and every, anything that can engage kids actively in their learning and engage them in higher level thinking. And one of my favorite platforms I love to share with teachers is a platform called Open Middle. But before we even get started, if you have your Chromebooks or computers on you, if you can go, that, if you can go to that tiny URL right there, that tinyurl.com slash nggn220m. I'm no, sorry, that's an O, not a zero. Uh, tinyurl.com slash nggn220m. That'll take you to this uh, Google Slides presentation. There's only like five slides here. I'm not much of a big uh, PowerPoint or slides person, but um, I love open middle. If you've never heard of it, you got to check it out and use it in your classroom. You'll see what I mean. I think you're going to really love what you see from the start. All right. So, uh, we want to engage kids in higher level thinking, right? When the pandemic hit two years ago, right? Everybody was learning from home. No one knew what was going on. How do we engage kids actively? And we try to, you know, teachers are trying to upload lessons to YouTube and they're banging their heads on their desks because nobody's watching those videos anyway. Let's face it, we don't need to make a video on solving a quadratic equations. There's thousands of them on, on YouTube anyway. And most of them are like, eh, to begin with. But right, but how do we take a how do we actually engage kids in higher level thinking and mathematics where they're at the center of their learning, but yet they're the ones creating, not just copying like robots. The problem with mathematics education overall is that we kids become these like uh, the, these robots. We open up their brain, we throw knowledge in their brain, we sew it back up. And then they, they do this worksheet repetitively consisting of like 20 or 30 or 40 problems and what learning truly takes place. We give them a test and we ask them to find the slope of a line. They're giving the equation. We ask them to write an equation. They're finding the slope. They're masters of procedure, but they truly lack conceptual understanding. Open middle helps to take care of all that. So if you go to this tiny URL right here, all right, and this is the, uh, the title right there, um, I want to uh, bring you to the next uh, page here before we start playing in GeoGebra with this. But if you think of all of the verbs that we use in math class, when we want students to do something, right? Uh, there, is a, there is a hierarchy called depth of knowledge. I'm not sure in Europe, I mean, you heard of that, but, like, but we have like four different levels of thinking. We have levels one, two, three, and four. Level one is the lowest level of thinking. Match, quote, report. Uh, tell, state, repeat, right? True or false. It becomes this procedural like monkey see, monkey do mentality. Like what's the slope of this line? What's the slope of this line? What's the slope of this line? It's the same thing day in, day out. It's, it's low level thinking. And I know here in the United States, the problem that we have in this country is that a lot of tests that teachers write, they give questions that are only at this level, right? But, but open middle starts, starts at a minimum of level two where students have to construct, I love that verb, construct, or interpret, maybe maybe uh, create, okay? Now, level three is a higher level thinking. That's strategic thinking. How can I uh, differentiate, investigate, all right? There's elements of level three, and sometimes we could push it to a level four where kids have to synthesize. That's a kind of higher form of creation right there. I'll give you an example, all right? So um, if you go to that fourth slide there, you can go to Open Middle's website right here. I'll take you there. Just to show you quickly what it's about. Open Middle was founded by uh, Robert uh, Kaplinsky and Nanette Johnson several years ago, but it, it is an awesome site. And honestly, you can find a plethora of, uh, of tasks here. Let me show you an example of, a, of an Open Middle problem, say from uh, fourth grade. We're gonna work more in middle and high school here, but let me see here, it's glitching out on me. Um, let me see here. Um, look at this. All right. So using the digits one to nine at most one time each. Whoops. Hang on. Sorry, my internet is a little slow here. Okay. Check this out. Using the digits one to nine at most one time each, place a digit in each box to make a true pattern where the pattern increases by the smallest amount possible. You see, I could imagine this, the problems we give kids already. It's like, hey, here's the sequence. What's the pattern? Oh, it adds by four every time. All right, adds by three, right? But here, students have to be the ones doing the, all the creating themselves. 
And for many teachers, this is a challenge, right? So just think of all the higher level thinking that's going on here. See, open middle starts with like, open middle has a closed beginning. There is a clear problem that students have to solve. And there is a closed end oftentimes. Well, there is a solution or there's many solutions. But the beautiful part of open middle is that the middle part of the problem is open. It's open to how we go about solving it. It's open to student thought. Oh, I want to try it this way. And you'll see what I mean as we play it, um, as we merge it with GeoGebra here. Okay. But let's go to uh, that same site there. If you, uh, if you could, if you bookmark this second link right here, all right, uh, I have a GeoGebra book of over like 120 or 150 different types of open middle problems. And they're all uh, categorized in, this, in, this, in these chap chapters here, right? But we're going to take a little sample of every one. And I'm going to have you role play student for a little bit on two activities because we all know how GeoGebra Classroom works anyway. Right. But let's go to uh, let's go to this. The very last page here, the sample one. Uh, we might not have time to do all of them, but I would like to go to the percent modeling problem. So could you go right here where it says take the role of the student? Uh, in the first one right there, go ahead, log in there and I want you to go play with it. All right. I'll hop there. And I'll show you an example of what I mean here. Look at you all in here. This is awesome. All right. Now I'm going to look at the student's original, but here's an example of an open middle problem. All right. Here we have to create. Look at the directions here. Using the digits, uh, this is an open middle problem originally created by Adrian, Adrian Burns, but I just made a GeoGebra version of it. All right. So using the digits zero to nine at most one time each, no repeats allowed, create, fill in the boxes to create an accurate number line. How many solutions can you find? All right. Now just stop and think of the thinking that has to go on here. Right. We have to actually take these numbers and put them in. All right. And so students start playing around with it. So when I ask kids, what's a popular percent? And they all tell me 50. 50% is pretty popular, right? Okay. So 50%. Notice it's filling in down there. Right. Um, let me see. 30. So we want, well, 34. What's 34, 50% of? And so let's say I do the math wrong. Let me put 78. You see, all I, all I use for GeoGebra here was the fact that, oh, does it, is it, it doesn't really match up. I mean, like the, that, that it's not perfect at the bottom. You see what I mean? But students have that aha moment. Oh, wait, 50% means half. Okay. So see, now it's like, now we're talking, there is a, there is a valid setup right here. You see what I mean? So when students have to build the problem a few times, I think that kind of shows evidence. I think that more than kind of shows evidence of true learning here. Instead of asking them to always find 50% of a number or find what number is 50%, why don't we, I love to have them create. And during the pandemic, this is how I assessed kids. They were all at home, but like trying to Google this or trying to photo math, this is a lot harder, right? Not that I'm anti Google or anti photo math. They have a time and a place in the classroom, but I think we need, as teachers, we need to ask students to create more. And, and analyze more and think more critically, all right? Um, and when kids work together. Now, this is an example of a depth of knowledge two question. Can you find another solution? Go for it, right? And so how about a third, right? But now that this is like depth of knowledge two. But how do I make it a DOK three question? Well, all I did when students, when I had a few students like solve this right away, all I did beforehand is I, I, um, I went back to the original. Let me go back to the original here, which is here. I could differentiate so beautifully with open middle. So I go back to the original. I want to copy. I'm going to copy this activity. You all know you can copy a GeoGebra activity, right? But watch this. So now what I, what I did the second time was, okay, I said to students, all right, so here, I want you to create another setup. But this time, don't use 50%, 25%. Or 75%, because aren't those the most popular percentages kids want to use? It's easy to find 50% or 25% or 75% of something, right? And so what, what do kids most what do most kids want to do? Well, let's do 10%. 10% is just I move the number, but wait a minute. And then kids have that aha moment. 10% is not going to work here. Because if I want to, if I make this, uh, if I make this 10%, right, I'm going to have repeated digits. You see what I mean? And there's a roadblock there. Oh crap, I have to go think differently. All right. So when we make students, we, we put students at the center, we're having them do We're having them create the problem. All right. Now, how else can how else can I actually differentiate? I might actually give them more directions and say, what is the highest possible percentage you can make down here, given these constraints? 
I, I, to be honest with you, I, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know the answer to that question. I have no idea what the highest percent is. I think I had one student do 92% or something like that. But given if you give your kids, if the kids that get it right away, let them play around with it. All you have to do is ask them, what is the highest possible percentage you can make given these constraints of no repeated digits? See what they come up with. I would love to see. Many times I give my kids questions that I don't know the answers to. And they surprise me. It's like, wow, you got 96%. You got, wow. You know? And how about another question? What is the lowest possible percentage you can make out of here? Could I make something that's like uh, 15% or maybe 8%? I don't know. But the point is, it's like, and again, I, ha I can't have decimals up here. I have to be, have whole numbers. But see how you could take a simple concept of percents. And now we're, we're just basically flipping it around. We're having the students create the problem. And I took one problem. And I just now branched off in several different higher level thinking tasks. You can keep your students engaged this way in higher level thinking. You see, finding what per, finding percents becomes secondary. The creation is what becomes more important. But if they, but my, my logic is if they can create the problem, then you know that they know it. And so in open middle, it's like we can ditch those like worksheets where kids repeat, repeat, repeat again and again. And it gets boring after a while. They become robots. Here, students aren't robots because they're the ones creating. All right, now we're just getting started. This is just an arithmetic example. With open middle, you could do so much more. I mean, let's, if you go to the building number sentences here. Oh, by the way, I haven't seen the, let me just go to George classroom right here. You can see, um, I could see a lot of you here. Look at that, right? We have Eric, Tanya, HK. We have a lot of people that are trying to build up here and you could see like, you know, the sky's the limit. Now I will tell you, hey, Marcus, like right here, um, if you leave a box blank, it technically counts as a zero. So I tell students every box got to get filled in. And I see a lot of you doing that here, but the students try to get away with it, but I don't let them. But um, I could say I could code it so that it's 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 better. But um, right now it works. It works for now. But see, here's an example right here. Very good, Tanya. Twenty three is fifty percent of forty six. Right now, I might want to ask students, say, if I make fifty percent the percent, what's the highest number I can make this this box right here? I, I could ask this question. I could branch off in so many different directions and engage every kid in higher level thinking. Maybe I split them up in the groups. You get the highest percentage. You get the highest number on the top right. You see, with GeoGebra, GeoGebra allows me to see every kid's thought process in real time. That's what I love about GeoGebra Classroom. It's beautiful, right? And when students home sick because of COVID, I have them hop on here and I can see their work just like everybody else in the class. All right, so let's go Let's go here, for example. Again, we're, we're going to work our way up to calculus slowly, but again, I, have, I know I have limited time. But if you take a look at this one here, you'll see what I mean right here. Um, all I want you to do is create a true number sentence here. That's it. Now, could I do this on paper? Sure, I could, right? But let's let's make a popular mistake here, right? Seven times, I guess five is not a good digit to use, right? Students have these aha moments that using a digit like one and five and zero is bad, right? Because it tends to end five or zero repeat. But um, let's uh, try something like this. Well, let's make a mistake. One plus three is four. Four times, uh, four times two, right? Let's say, let's say I do this first. I know that's bad math, right? But that's four. Uh, four times two is eight. So I have to make this a zero eight here, right? And now kids can get some feedback. Uh, check. Ooh, left side is bigger. Oh crap, what did I do wrong? Oh, I think about it. Oh, okay. Um, left side is less than. Oh, that's three times two is six. Okay, so I best I better change that, right? And there you go. Warm up with a few of these. Again, you could copy this activity and you can ask students to make the highest number possible. I think I do that down here. Um, different from the three. Yeah, see like right here, what is the highest possible value? You can get either side to equal. That's taking it and going one step higher. Now you can copy this and make your own versions of this. The, the, the GeoGebra applet's done. You just gotta you know, be, do you be your creative self and just make those higher level challenges for kids. All right, open middle. I'm gonna have you, uh, I'm gonna have you play with this here just so you can, one more, just to experience it as a student there. I see two of you are getting ahead and getting it already. But if you can go to that uh, second, uh, uh, join this as a student here, right? Welcome, welcome. Last one, I'll ask you to join. But the rest, I'm just going to kind of show and illustrate the concept, the power of open middle here. Um, again, GeoGebra, I love the power of GeoGebra because you can literally see not only results in real time, but we can make a, conce we can make a conceptual connection between the, the algebraic and the graphical, right? Here we have four points we're allowed to move around, right? Like so. But we have to position these points effectively 
so that we create four different slope statements that are true. For example, right? I'll move, I'll move B here. See how my slope is one half? So I'll put a one here and I'll put a two here. And it'll say, it'll, it'll pop me through. The goal is to get four pink true statements. All right. Now this is a lot harder for students than it looks. Think of what we as teachers often ask kids. We, we give them a sheet of problems, find the slope, find the slope, find the slope, find the slope. And there's never any feedback as whether it's right or wrong, except that the teacher looks at the paper. Oh, yes, yes, no, no, yes. Not a lot of learning going on here. But all I need to do is move A over here. Oh, crap, it's wrong. But if I, again, hit that button there, that makes it positive or negative, it's true. But now I have to somehow, I have to somehow work with this to make the slope of BC uh, a certain fraction there. So let me make the slope here. Now students will tell me, well, Mr. B, the slope, Mr. Brzezinski, the slope here is, uh, I'll make the line there, I custom tool. The slope there is two over one, but I'm using the two over one already. And I say, yeah, so can we keep it that way? And they look at me like, well, can you write two over one differently? And then only oh, four over two. Oh, I can I can put that as six over three. You see, now now I'm digging back to like now I'm digging back to number sense. How can I write fractions in an equivalent sense? All right, but you see how naturally open middle is a, open middle is a higher level thinking kind of a task. We're still assessing kids' knowledge of the same basic concepts, but at a higher level where they have to create. And if you want to photo math or Google something, you want to Google how to find the slope of a line because you forgot. By all means, knock yourself out. Feel free. If Google helps you, if you forget how to find slope, look it up as a picture and then see if you could build it here. To me, that's not cheating. That's being resourceful in this 21st century, right? But see, if my students can build a few of these successfully, well, there's a great 20 point quiz right there. I don't have to give a paper quiz. I can give them this and I'm, I assess them, they know it. Now we could talk about finding the slope of a line given two points, right? And so what slopes can I not make here? And these are questions I ask kids all the time. Is anybody in the audience, is there any slope that I am not allowed to make here? Be, or any, what two slopes am I not allowed to make? Or three? Because I can't, yeah, yeah, I see that. No slope of zero, right? Because the zero is missing, right? And I can't make a slope of one because wouldn't I be repeating a digit technically, right? The rise and run cannot be equal or the absolute values of the rise and run cannot be equal. So negative one's not allowed either. But you see, engage your kids in that and the, they will surprise you. Now I can ask, what's the highest possible slope? You can make, again, you could copy that, do what you want. But see, open middle is just, it's a beautiful thing. You get there. Let's take a look at the Pythagorean theorem. Something so basic. Instead of asking kids to solve for a missing side of a right triangle, why not have them build it? So let me make a three, four. What's a three, four, five, right? And let me, let me get this wrong. Let me put 30. Ooh, ouch. I mean, see, I love GeoGebra because I can build it to scale. That is not a right triangle, is it? Oh, crap. Let me see something here. So let me make it 20. Nope, that's a cute, right? A 25, right? I just, I made a right triangle, no digits repeat. So I ask students, I want you to build me four different right triangles and then go ahead and show me why Okay, three squared plus four squared, or they do it on paper, whatever. I could put the text box in there if you want me to. But you, you see what I'm saying? My students are creating now. Now, how do I copy this activity and make it a higher level thinking challenge? What's the highest possible value I can make the hypotenuse here? It can't be the square root of 99 because that's going to repeat, right? What about the square root of 98? Oh, we see 90. Can I make it the square root of 98 here? Well, that'll be a seven and a seven, but oh shoot, that's a repeated digit. You see what I'm saying? That's a right triangle, but it's still, it, it's, uh, it repeats. Well, is there any other way I can actually square two numbers and add them and get 98? You let your students figure that out, right? Now, then I also ask kids to be resourceful. Let's go to Google Sheets, put list of numbers, list of numbers, and then in one column, something squared, something squared. I teach kids how to make Google Sheets and see if they can find that later. But again, but the point is the Pythagorean theorem becomes secondary because they're the, 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 the actual doing of the math, but here they have to create the problem. I have a version of this where they have a three digit hypotenuse and a two digit leg. There's, they're all in that book that you see right there. Okay, they're all there. Um, but you know what? Because I love GeoGebra so much, I say, I like to push the boundary a little bit. And I said, well, can I ask my students to just do this maybe in three dimensions? Look at that. Using digits zero to nine, no more than once. 
create a rectangular prism <laughs> whose length is a two-digit number, width is a one-digit number, height is a one-digit number, and the diagonal is that. But no digits are allowed to repeat. Let's see what the, let's see what Joshua can bring to the table. All right. So here we go. Now again, let me make the length. By the way, I can make this a one-digit number if I wanted to. Just put a zero there. I let kids do that all the time. But again, you can only use it once. But let me make this 15, see? And let's make the width, say, six. And let's make the height uh, eight. Now, I have no idea what this is now. See here, it's like, okay, we got that 15 by six by eight prism. And there's the conceptual insight. Oh my gosh, I got Pythagorean theorem twice, don't I? So 15 squared plus six squared plus eight squared. Uh, I should have picked lower numbers, sorry. But someone do the math for me and I can't do it in my head right now. But let me just pick the, let me make it 307. It's probably probably too short, right? But see, I like to do this here because I can actually compare the length here and see. Ooh, that's a good guess. Not bad. It's a little longer in 307. Maybe it's, what is it? Anybody give me that? Uh, What's 225 and 36 and 64? I do it in my head. 317, 317, 327? Uh, 320. 325. What is it? 335. 335? I think so. Oh, 325. Sorry, there you go. It's correct. But see, I have, oh, wait a minute. No digits repeat. I got to fix that. I just realized there's repeated digit there. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> there's a button. I have to fix the error there. But see, there we go. The whole, the whole, the whole point is to get no digit to repeat. Um, I think I have to fix the programming of that. So I'll do that maybe next week. But the point is, I mean, again, you'll see this in GeoGebra Classroom. I apologize for that. There, that, is, and that is a mistake. There is a five that repeats here. But now what's the highest value I can make the diagonal? The square root of, the square root of 989, uh, 987 maybe? And can I get three? You know what I mean? But let the kids create. Let them figure it out. All right. Well, let's see. Um, so what about parallel lines and related angles? I love this problem by John Rowe. It's on open middle site. Look at this. Using the digits zero to nine without repetition. Go ahead and fill in those blanks. Don't we ask students to always solve for X? Oh, find the missing angle. Find the missing angle. If those lines are parallel, let them, if they can, listen, if they can create this without repeating a digit and show you why, they know it. Right? So, so what you, I thought, I saw this and I'm like, wait a minute, we can make this in GeoGebra. We totally could. Like, like if this angle is 118, I can make that one. See how it's built to scale there? Like on the right is what it really looks like. So if I make this say 102, right? Now this has to be supplementary. So let's make that a, what, a 78? No, I'm actually, no, I'm sorry. No, these, these two angles here have to add the 78. My bad, right here. So um, let me make this say 38 and say 59. Oh, wait a minute. What am I doing? I can't think straight right now, but the point is there are, there are tons of solutions here. I, I tell you there are, but um, wait, these two, ang these two angles here, I have to add to the third one. So nine and three is 12, one and five, six, four is 10. So 59 and 43, right? And so now, you know, you could kind of mess around and, and play with that there, right? But I want to show you more. So, I mean, you could find solutions on your own. How about a system of linear equations? Listen, I could give my students a system and I hold photo math to it. It'll solve it for them. You can Wolfram Alpha that thing, right? So again, not that it's bad. Should students know how to solve a system algebraically? Of course they should, right? But here's a different twist on it in an open middle style. Using this one, this problem here says, using digits negative nine to nine, no more than one time each. Create me a system of three equations that all <laughs> intersect at one, one. And there's your quiz. Wait a minute. Okay. So talk, let, let me uh, go ahead. Let's say, uh, let me make this one. So if I make this one half, right? Obviously I have the number sense here. Well, half of one is half of one is 0. 0.5. And I can't, I can't have an ended a decimal other than 0. 0.0. So students are having number sense talks with each other. No, 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 no. This has to be, this has to be, it can't have a decimal here. So let me make this a two over one. Two times one and two times one is two plus um, plus negative one is one, right? And there we go. But if I get it wrong, see, I just, you see what I mean? Now I'm not allowed to use negative one, one, one again. 
Well, can I use a slope of zero and cheat a little bit? Sure. Let me use negative five. Oh, but wait a minute. You see what I mean? I have I have a one right here. I'm using the, I'm using one repeatedly. So let's actually be creative and let's let's type in four over two. See what I mean? Let's get students to think differently with you know writing equivalent ratios in any aspect we can. Students are creating. And as teachers, let me tell you something. These are easy to grade. You get quality is better than quantity. So if I give my students a few of these, like maybe one, one, nine, six, right? I, I grade them. I look at Joe's classroom, I grade them. I see their written work or their types work in front of me. Grading is a lot faster. And I have more time to be creative and create more activities for my kids to engage them. It takes forever to grade like a five page paper test, doesn't it? But here, grading is quick. And students are thinking at a higher level. All right, and let's see if I can get another one here. Let me make a negative slope. Let's say negative five. Let's say ne negative five over, uh, gosh, that put me on the spot. I am still hungry. I didn't eat much breakfast yet. But again, it is possible. I've done it many times before, but I don't want to take time to solve it for you. I want to just show you all the possibilities here, what you can do. All right. How about algebra and geometry together? Ooh. Now, this one, I was a little bit bold and daring here. I'm, not, I'm surprised this actually came out to fruition here, but here we go. I gave this to some of my geometry students the other day. If we fully spin the function y equals blank over blank x, where zero is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to blank, about the x-axis, we get a cone whose volume is blank blank over blank blank pi cubic units. Oof, that's a beast. Now, let's let's see if, let's let's play with this if we can see it here. Now. I'm actually going to go to, you know what? I'm going to cheat a little bit and go to my school account and see because some of my students did this already. So I'm just going to copy what, see what they did. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, where was it? Ah, Cone, here it is. Let me just hide the names. All right, here we go. So one of my students did this here. Let's see what they did. Aha, here's one. See, I don't all possibilities here, but right here, here's an example of one that actually works, right? And then that, those students who got them quickly, I asked them, "What's the biggest you can make the volume?" And they they were not they were they were smoke coming out of their ears. While my other students were working on some of the other stuff, see, open middle allows me to also flexibly differentiate. Where I have my kids, I want my no all students should be able to do X Y Z my lesson objectives. But for students that meet the objectives right away. Oftentimes I differentiate them in high level thinking by giving them an extension of an open middle problem. This was one of them. Now think of all the concepts that are in this one question. Um, writing the equation of a line, I'm restricting the domain of a function, that's from algebra one. But now I'm also finding the volume of, I'm making a surface of revolution, there's geometry. And I'm also finding the volume of a cone. Well, there's a little bit of geometry in algebra, right? A lot of concepts enrich deeply in one, rich, enrich deeply in one question, right? A lot, and it's very easy to grade. I mean, I made this so that GeoGebra with, with their Boolean operators and checkboxes and true or false, this is, it's, it's not that, all right? I have a video on, um, on I think GeoGebra's YouTube channel while I was working for them as their PD director. There was one or two, there was one a video where I showed how I make an open middle problem. Um, if I find it, I'll put it on the link to the YouTube video after. If you're, if you're interested in making stuff like this, so those who want to go like to the next level, um, could totally uh, show you that. But right here, um, let's go back here. We got about five or 10 minutes left. So let's look at a coordinate geometry example. Look at this. Um, using digits zero to nine, no more than one time each, I want you to build me a parallelogram. And then justify why. Notice how I customize, notice how we can customize a toolbar in GeoGebra. So the goal here is to build a parallelogram without repeating coordinates. And again, I actually forced it so it can't go beyond nine and it can't go beyond uh, zero here. Or, right? So obviously this is out. This is no good because X repeats and Y repeats. And so, well, I want to do it this way, right? Well, the Y repeats now. So it's every segment is forced to be non-horizontal or vertical, right? So if I do this here, I mean, there's many setups that will work, but students have to just come up with one. The goal and the object is you cannot, you're not allowed to repeat a digit. Oh, I'm repeating a digit there. I repeat a digit there, right? But the point is, there are many possibilities here. I think I got here. I actually, I just made a rhombus now, didn't I? But um, I have a, there's a version of this where I ask kids to make a rhombus, to make a rectangle, <coughs> to make a square. It's all in that big open middle book that you have there. 
What is the biggest rhombus I can make? What is the smallest? I can differentiate in higher level thinking and having kids use the GeoGebra tools to now, to now justify and explain to me why. Oops, that is not a rhombus, I'm sorry. Um, so, oh yeah, but anyway. Um, all right, there, I'll do one or two more. I see it right there, Lori, but here's a numberless one. Here's one without numbers. I know open middles always have numbers, but it's all about creating. Uh, what does the problem say here? And this is in the book. The large points in the circle are all movable. Move these around to make the line tangent to the circle. Right? We're talking about lines <laughs> tangent to circles, a lot of slope right here. But again, here's some insight. Can we, uh, can we go ahead and make this line tangent to the circle? And then I extend it. I say, hey, don't make the line vertical. Don't make it horizontal. You see what I mean? That's what the next task asks. Again, for, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder than it looks uh, in the immediate. I'll give you, I'll do one or two trick examples and a calc example, then we'll call it a day. Is that okay, Lori? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so right, here's another example of one. Uh, I've only found two solutions to this one. Many open middle examples have only, uh, have many solutions or setups. Some open middle questions have only one solution. Like what's the highest possible value you can make given these constraints? This one has two solutions, but if you take a look at the problem right there, uh, the graphs of y equals blank sine x plus blank and blank cosine x plus blank do not intersect at all. The max value reached by the greater function is what? And then the lowest, the minimum is min, right? And so, and I have a Google doc link to one right there. But then if I take a look at this and say, let's, let's give it a shot and see, I actually did this on paper first with kids before I gave them the tech. Because again, tech is not tech is not the answer to all our problems, but there are some problems I give the kids first on paper, open middle, and then I'll have them check on GeoGebra or whatever. But see, like right here, let me just go ahead and move something like this, right? Well, I should probably make that sine wave higher, right? One sine x plus eight. So the highest I get, so the highest value I achieved is nine, right? The max is nine. Now I need to make another function here. Let me make it four cosine x plus five. Uh-oh, th those graphs cross. They're not allowed to cross. Shoot. Uh, let me make it three. Oh, but uh, crap, I can't have a negative number here. It, it dips in the negative land. See what I mean? So let me make this a two, perhaps. No. Nope. Uh, oh, wait, I have to make that. Let me make it a, a five. Or Oh, what if I did five and four? You see, we talk about what we're trying to have kids conceptualize amplitude and... Um, and uh, and translations like the average value of a, fun of a of a sine wave, right? We're having them work with those concepts in a creative, flexible way. There actually are only two solutions to the problem. I can't forget what they are right now, but um, but they do intersect quite easily. All right. And so uh, a harder trick example is like this. This one I believe doing it on paper is much better first. Using digits zero to nine, no more than once. You have to fill in these blanks. Now I have to make a period of four. Let's make an amplitude of two. Let's shift it over five notches and we'll make the average value three. Ooh, okay, I, I, I can get this, I get this. Where does the minimum value occur? Uh, the min is one, it occurs at X equals zero. There's that, that works, right? The max is five. Uh oh, crap, I repeated a digit already. Got to go back to the drawing board. But the max value does occur at, uh, where does it occur? It occurs at six. See, I wanted my students to have that aha moment that the period has to be a multiple, that this denominator should be a multiple of four in order for it to work. You see what I mean? But um, again, I mean, the period is four. That's, this is the period right here, right? In, in, order for, in order for it to be a whole number, making this denominator four is a good idea. And it took kids, it took some students 15 minutes to have that aha moment. But now they understand the concept of period and, and the parameters so much more deeply. All right. Um, again, you could be so creative with this. You really can. Last but not least, let's talk calculus for you calc people in the room. Again, someone else created this problem, uh, Catriona Ag. Um, she's on Twitter. I love her geometry puzzles. But she created this problem right here, and I decided to geogebra it, if you will. The tangent to this function at the point blank blank is that. So whatever you type in here. One, two, three, right? Four, five, right? And, uh, oh, I guess it doesn't, uh, doesn't pass through at all, right? So none of these, the coordinates and none of these digits can repeat. 
Open Middle Teachers is a great, it's an awesome resource. Open Middle takes you to a, takes you and your students to a place where you can not only engage them in high level thinking, but you can assess them in basic in the concepts they need to learn and understand in that modality. Their their level of thinking goes up. Your, your time spent grading is going down and it also empowers you as a teacher to have much more rich, deeper conceptual conversations with students. And I asked students, well, why did you choose to put the five there? Well, what, what's, the, what's the disadvantage of making that number of five or a four? You're going high, you're going into that higher level thinking. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, so everything is, again, the link to that entire GeoGebra book is right here. Whoops, wrong one. The link to that GeoGebra book is on page three or no five. This where it says ready to use right there. That is, that is the mind. That's the gold mine right there. All right. If you have an idea for an old middle problem, you create one, send it, send it to me. I would love to, I would love to put it in the book. Some of the ones here are made by Steve Phelps, uh, John Albright. I have a lot of them in there too, but if you create Sam Cruz, if you create one, send me an email. My email is right there. Uh, social media, the, the QR car, our code right there, send me one. And if it works, I, I'll throw it in the book there. Let's, let's get these out to teachers. They, they, uh, they'd love it. All right. So I know my time is pretty much open. Thank you so much for your time. And if there's any questions, I'll stick around, but otherwise have a, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Tim. We we'll leave for the subway, but thank All right. you. Enjoy, have a great dinner. All right. After one minute. <laughs> All right, YouTube people.